Good morning and welcome to Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. I'm Pastor Dan and this is Pastor Lowe, our worship (laughs) pastor. And we're so glad that you decided to join us this morning. And we have an incredible service planned for you. Yes, we do. Do you know that Pastor Jeff today is back with a brand new series? Let's go! Brand new series, Calm in the Chaos. Wow. It is going to be awesome, and I can't wait to hear it. Absolutely. I can't wait to hear it either, and I know it's going to be great. So good to have Pastor Jeff back in the pulpit. Yeah. But, hey, listen, we are back. We are in the flow of things. We are uh, fully going with our in-person service for the 8.30 and the 10 o'clock service. We'd love for you to join us. Uh, we are taking every single precaution that we know how to to make sure that you are safe. We are fully sanitized, and we are following social distancing protocols. So we can't wait to see you. Now, I say all of that not to put pressure on you because there's no pressure, but we do want you to know that when we, when you, sorry, when you are ready, we are ready for you. And speaking of being ready for Come you, on. Grace Kids is whoop, back. Whoop. <laughs> how was last week? Oh, it was awesome. I love it. We had tons of kids show up. We had uh, just a great time being together. No it was doubt. great seeing kids back Indeed. on campus. My boys love back it. At, you know, yeah. it's time for kids to get back to church. Come on. Come on. My kids, your kids, <laughs> everybody else's kids. I love it. They need to get back to church. We had an awesome time and uh, just discipling and ministering to our kids That's again. Amazing, so man. it was awesome. For and sure, so we, sure. like Pastor Lowe has been saying, we are back in the flow. And uh, so we're looking forward to this weekend as well for both services, 8.30 and 10 a.m. And it will still be online, right? And it will still be online. Yeah. We're going to continue to stream all of our content online as usual. So whenever you choose to come back, you don't have any pressure from us. You can continue to watch at home, yeah. online. But when you do choose to come back, when we are do. here. And if you have your kiddos, bring them on in. Yeah. We have a hands-free check-in process. Yes, yes. So once you come in, we email you a, a mobile pass, yeah. just like at Disney. Yeah. And you just mobile pass you in, and it's all hands-free, all sanitized and safe for everybody. Man, Grace and, Kids uh, is killing it, man. There, we That's had amazing. a great service this last yeah. weekend. We posted some some pictures on our Facebook groups Very page. Cool. So if you can get on that, Very check cool. that out. And uh, we would love for you to see that. Also, we've got, of course, on our Wednesdays, Wednesdays are a big day around here. Yes, indeed. Worship Wednesdays, and that's um, with, well, Pastor Lorenzo. Yes. And uh, these guys take one specific song and just start worshiping the Lord and have a worship moment right there. Worship Wednesdays, 10 a.m., Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And YouTube. And you can check that out, as well as Deep Dive at 5. And that's where Pastor Jeff and some of our other pastors Go a little bit deeper yeah. into the messages and well just be able to, uh, you know, what's the word? Dissect. Yeah. Just a little bit deeper the into text. the word of God. And so they do yes. that deep dive at five <laughs> on Wednesdays. And yes. so that really creates some great mom- momentum. Absolutely. Momentum. Momentum. Momentum coming <laughs> into the service on Sunday. Hey, so. absolutely. And, guys, we have big news Beach baptisms are back. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, listen, if you've been wanting to follow in in, in baptism and follow um, in obedience as God has given us instruction once we have accepted Christ, we would love for you to take that next step. If you want to do that, you can go online uh, on our website at gogracefellowship.org forward slash baptism, and you'll see our baptism interest form, and it's going to be September 27th at 5 p.m. at Ocean Reef Park. Yeah. You don't want to miss it. I'm excited for you. We are excited as a church I'm gonna be and there. as pastors to yeah. walk with you and see you take the next step. So also, speaking of next steps, we got a lot of next steps, man. We do. That's good. They Indeed. need steps. They hey. need to know how to get there. Steps are good. That's good. Hey, man. Hey, man. They get but you. Anyway, our next, another step that you can take is called starting point. Starting point is uh, one class. It's our on-ramp to everything Grace Fellowship where you can learn more about our church 
and, and what God is doing here and seeing if maybe you even want to partner with us and become a member. Um, our next virtual starting point will be on October 4th. It will be at 1245 via Zoom. And like baptisms, you can go to our website, gogracefellowship.org forward slash starting point, and you can fill out um, the form there, and we'll get all the information to you that you need to attend starting point. We would love for you to join and be a part of that. Yeah, virtual starting point. We had a great one this last one. Some sure. great people in sure. there. And Labor Day weekend and could still you a great turnout. A, a great that amazing? turnout, great questions, Indeed. and people just getting involved. So it For was sure. good. No doubt. It was good. Well, listen, we are almost to the end of our pre, pre-service, pre-show time. Yeah, man. But one thing left is we would love to know, where are you watching from? I don't know if it's from a different state, a different country, wherever you're from. Would you mind just mentioning that in the comments below? We would just love to have a record of that just to know where you are watching from. Absolutely. All right, so our time is running out, and it's time to get into service. Let's have church. And that service starts right now. Grace Fellowship Online. I'm so glad to have you. Won't you guys please join us in worship and praise this morning? Come on. Who makes the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is amazing.
just to take him at his word oh just to In the land of the living, oh yes, 
That is the truth, Lord, that you have worked all things out. And we know how the story goes, and at the end, we win. And God, we know also sometimes it's just really hard to, to get out of the funk that we're in. Because of the disappointments and the trials and the tribulations, the chaos that's in our life. But I thank you that your word says, come to me and I will give you rest. Those that are heavy laden, those that are burdened, come to me and I will give you rest. So help us, Lord, to rest in the power of your scripture, the power of your word that you've spoken to us. Help us to be as your word says in Psalm 46.10, to be still and know that you are God. Help us to trust you, Lord. Help us in our unbelief. Help us in our weakness. As your word says, when we are weak, you are strong. We thank you, Lord, that you bring calm in the chaos. And you are so great. You're greatly to be praised. And we love you and we thank you. God, help us to live lives, Lord, that, that look like Christ. Thank you for the hope that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. And wherever you are together, let's say it. Amen and amen. Welcome again to Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. We're so glad to have you guys here with us. Listen, we don't want this just to be a one-way broadcast. We want to connect with you guys, whether you're here in the house or watching online. So we have a QR code here. And if you just open the photo app on your smart device and point the camera to the screen, that will make the QR code available right there to you on your device. And this is a way for you to let us know where you are. If you have something that we can pray about for you, let us know. If, if you want to make a step towards the Lord Jesus, whether it's to become a follower of Christ or you have questions about Christianity, maybe you're interested in our next beach baptism on the 27th of this month. Uh, just let us know through the Connect card and we want to help you and guide you and speak into your life uh, as you follow the Lord Jesus Christ and have your questions answered. We also have a verse today as we consider giving. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says this, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And here at Grace, that characterizes so many of you guys, and you've just been so faithful to give to the Lord, knowing that in good times and in bad times, he is God above all the nations. He is God over and through all history. So thank you for your continued faithfulness. And if you are a new follower of Christ, and if you've not, you've not yet taken this step of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, know this, that you can never outgive God, and that where your treasure is, your heart is also. And when when we give, God not only uses the gift to reach people for him, he also creates in us a beautiful 
spirit of joyful giving. So let's pray right now as we connect through the online connect card and for our members and our regular attenders, uh, giving through one of these options. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are humbled to be here, that you have brought us from where we have been to this place right now for us to engage in singing songs about you, to learning from the word of God here in just a few moments. And we pray that in Jesus' name, that wherever we are on the spectrum of faith, or maybe some of us, we we are followers of Christ, but we have become disillusioned and discouraged. Lord, speak to us deep inside our mind and our heart and remind us of who you are. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. We want to welcome you guys who are here in the area watching us online and people who are far out of Palm Beach County. One of the incredible things that we've seen the Lord do is allow us to be connected to so many of you guys that are not local to Palm Beach County. And so wherever you're watching from, whether it's here in this country or overseas, we welcome you into this place. And I want you to know that you make our day, you make our week, you make our year when you let us know where you are and what God is doing in your life. It's just so incredibly cool. And it just pumps us up to engage with people literally all over the place. Planet. And we give God all the praise and all the glory. If this is your first time watching us online or here in the house, we welcome you here to Grace Fellowship. We want to say right out of the gate that we believe that the word of God is from God, that it is true in every issue that it speaks to. And God has preserved his word. That is the ultimate authority, not me. I have the honor of serving as our lead pastor here at Grace, but this church is not grounded on any other foundation other than Jesus Christ himself and the revelation he's given us through the word of God. So we're going to have a good time this morning jumping into a brand new series, but I want to give you a special heads up about something that is thrilling our hearts and pumping up our spirits. For the first time since the pandemic, we are having an official beach baptism. Come on. September 27th, Sunday at 5 p.m. at Ocean Reef Park. This is one of the group photos from one of our previous pandemic or I, I, <laughs> pre-pandemic uh, beach baptisms. And we're just going to get out there. and We're in phase two now as a county and now as a region. And we're just going to get out there. And for those who are ready to follow Jesus Christ and believers baptism by immersion, we're just going to have a joyous, awesome, uh, fun-filled time seeing God at work in your life. Life. And know this, that if you are ready to follow Jesus Christ in a public, meaningful way through believer's baptism, that that is your sermon with no words. By you being baptized, going under the water and coming out of the water, you are letting everybody know who's watching that you believe that Jesus Christ really lived, he really died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was raised on the third day. It is you sporting your team colors. Now that we're in the season of sports here, you are letting people know where your allegiance lies and it lies with the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're interested in baptism or maybe this is the first time you've really heard anything like this mentioned, let us know through the online connect card and we want to help you with any questions that you may have. So we're here at the beginning of our brand new series called Calm in the Chaos. It's from the book of Ephesians in the New Testament in chapter 4. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be walking through chapter 4, verse by verse. And in this day and time, this is a particularly needed chapter of the Bible in our lives. These are very much needed messages. With all that's happening in our world, almost on a constant daily basis throughout the day, we are hit with new news that is, that is heart-shattering and alarming in so many different ways and so many different angles. That, brothers and sisters, as followers of Jesus Christ, 
Or for those of you that are not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, you've not yet committed your life to him, but you're thinking about it, here's what we need. We need calm in the chaos. So today we're going to talk about how do we navigate the chaos. And we're going to talk about the word of God, Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 1 through 6. And here's our main idea this morning. It is to walk your call. It is to live your life through the power of God to the calling that he has called you to. So let's read these six verses and then we're going to try to unpack as much as we can in our time together this morning. Here's what the word of God says. This is the apostle Paul speaking. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And here's the tone. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So let's talk about this morning in the midst of chaos, how does God's word lead us to respond? Number one, you'll notice in verse one, it is to walk in the track of your calling. In other words, God's word does not uh, bind us in slavery, but it gives us godly, helpful, healthy boundaries in which to walk. Verse one speaks of the track of our calling. Now notice again, the apostle Paul says, I therefore a prisoner of the Lord urge you. This is a strong appeal. And so you see right out of the gate, the apostle Paul, under the inspiration and the power of God's spirit, is calling these believers in this town called Ephesus to do something great for God. Now, just a little bit of background. We'll get into more of this in the weeks that follow. But Ephesus was a crazy, broken, twisted, wicked place. There was so much occult activity in Ephesus. It was like the publishing hub of this time in this area of the world that anything having to do with uh, the dark arts, with sorcery, with, uh, with the occult activity, they were literally known as Ephesian writings. This was a place that was filled with uh, demon worship and idol worship to the point that people often would practice this so-called religion, which was basically just a blanket for people practicing out the lusts of the human heart. They would practice that through things like temple prostitution. So it's just a bizarre thought for us today. Say, hey, what are you going to do at church today? Well, we're going to go to this temple uh, dedicated to uh, Diana of the Ephesians or Artemis, these pagan deities, and we're going to, well, fill in the blank. It's just a crazy, twisted, wicked place that God called the Apostle Paul to go to. Now imagine him coming to this place called Ephesus, this magnificent, thriving metropolis, and he walks up and he sees these massive temples dedicated to these demonic deities that, again, were nothing but a cover for humans to live out and excuse the lust and the perversity of the human heart. Basically, the thoughts that some of us have are like, "Woo! I wasn't looking to think that. Like, I, I was just walking to get my mail. Where in the world did that come back? Like, Ephesus was where people had institutionalized these ideas and these sins and these patterns. But yet God called the Apostle Paul to go and to plant churches. So this is the guy who is doing the urging. He says, guys, I'm calling you to do something great. God has called all of us to walk in the track of our calling. Now, Notice what he uses to qualify who he is. I therefore a, what, a prisoner for the Lord. All right, so again, this is like he just starts out in chapter 4 that begins with this, this practical injunction. Chapters 1 through 3 in the book of Ephesians are the doctrine that teaches us what we believe and who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. In chapters 4, 5, and 6, if you've ever read through the book of Ephesians, it talks about how we actually go about living out that teaching and that doctrine from Christ. And he says, I am a prisoner for the Lord. Literally the word here, prisoner, it has to do with something that is, or someone that is bound or fettered. Someone who has been 
in chains for the Lord Jesus Christ. So he pulls, hey, I'm persecuted for you. I'm in prison for you. God has called me to suffer to the point of persecution and prison. So here's what I'm trying to do. Here's the Apostle Paul. He's, look, I'm in prison. I'm in chains. All that God is asking you to do, he's asking me to remind you and urge you, is to walk in the track of your calling. He said, guys, God has called us to be lights in the midst of a broken and twisted and dark world. God has called us to be his people in this day and in this time. And here in the 21st century, the call is the same for us today. But he's saying, I am in prison that it has actually cost me. Now, if you back up to chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says this as well in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. What's going on there? God is giving the apostle Paul the wisdom to communicate to people that he is now followers of Christ with. It is a collection of people who did not have a similarity in culture or ethnicity, but through the power of Jesus Christ, he had made them into one family. What Paul is reminding them is say, guys, I was raised by people who said I shouldn't be with your people, and you were raised by people who said you shouldn't be with my people. But I am here because of what Christ has done in my life. I am literally suffering suffering on your behalf. Guys, that is crazy transformative that God would take in that day and time a Jew who was a Jew of all Jews. This guy was, I mean, absolutely the one who was the expert in the law. He was a Hebrew of all the Hebrews, but yet God called him to be the disciple and the apostle, the missionary to the Gentiles. And so there's this this connection, there's this, this powerful message for today that in a day of identity politics and political tribalism, we have this priceless gold mine from the word of God. And let me just say this, that if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and when you read the word of God, all that you get out of it is it confirms your prejudices and your presuppositions about other people, then it's highly likely you're not actually reading the Bible, but you're reading yourself into the Bible. Because when you allow the word of Christ to get in your mind and get in your heart, He begins to change you. You begin to develop the mind of Christ that says this. Even if there are people who don't look like me, who don't speak like me, who don't act or dress like me, I am bound to the call of Jesus Christ to help as many people as I can come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior before I draw my last breath. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us a way out of idolatry. There's some people today who will claim to be followers of Christ, but when they say that they read the Bible, all it, all it does is confirm, that, hey, you know what, I'm better than that group of people. You know what, I think that I'm a Christian, but no, if you're a follower of Christ, you must have a love from God in your heart for people who don't look like you, who pe- people who may not speak like you. That is the transformative power of the word of God because the oldest trick in the book is idolatry. That is to make a God into our own image, a God who says that everybody else needs to change, but I need no changing at all. We make God into our own image when God shrugs our God. Well, we see my God. No, there is only one God. We make God into an idol when he simply shrugs his shoulders at abortion, racial superiority, and the acid of resentment and bitterness. Brothers and sisters, he has come to make us one. Not in a forced coercion, but out of a love that we have received from God himself through Christ on the cross. It is that love that looks at other people. And maybe we weren't raised to like a certain group of people, but through the power of Christ, we have a love that we cannot explain its depths because Christ has loved us with a love that we could never have earned. And you see, that's what brought the Apostle Paul together with these Gentiles in the first century. And that's what can bring us together today. And there is a church in West Palm Beach Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations, in which God has done for years and decades a powerful work, bringing people together from different backgrounds, but they have one Lord and one Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. And that is the one and the only one that will truly bind our hearts together. So the apostle Paul says, hey, live out your calling. 
And I urge you, notice verse 1, to walk in a, this is, this is incredibly powerful, in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, the word walk in the New Testament, it has to do with a pattern of which we live our lives. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, we're going to get to this <clears throat> next, uh, next couple of weeks. It says, now I say this and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. In chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16 says, look carefully then how you Walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, for the days are evil. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. I could go on and on, but just sharing a couple of these references. It says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. When he says to walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called, it has to do with the weight of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's a very specific call. So we ask the question then, okay, well, what is the track of my calling? What is God actually calling me to walk in? Your, God's will for your life, ultimately, big picture, widescreen, is that you would make disciples of all nations. That is your purpose for your life. It's my purpose for my life. That is God's redemption in us and through us to reach a world that is hurting. It is to point people to Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul said, hey guys, I'm gospel level serious. I'm calling you, reminding you again, we didn't grow up the same, we don't look the same, we don't speak the same, but God has brought us together because we have the same Savior. And if you have the same Savior, you have the most fundamental part of your life. You have the greatest issue, the greatest allegiance and loyalty, but you have that with people who were raised different than you do. That's what brings people together. And that's how you can have a church of all nations to the glory of God. The Apostle Paul is saying, hey guys, I have no divided allegiance. And in this year, we are all being challenged with the question, where does your ultimate allegiance lie? Number two, in verse two, in a time of chaos, we are called to walk with the tone of your calling. Here's the tone that the Apostle Paul is saying. Okay, he's called you to, to make disciples of all nations, to be Christ wherever you are. And here's the tone of your life that should be exhibited as you walk in the track of your calling. Notice, with all humility, not some, not partial. Man, this is hard stuff. I'm going to be honest. This is hard stuff. With all humility. And gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. All right, we're gonna have a lot. Of, we're gonna have a lot of fun with this section here. So, humility it has to do with that posture that we take towards God and other people. Now, again, the Apostle Paul is writing to Gentiles, people who were not raised with the Bible. They didn't know God before someone had explained it to them. They didn't have it in the background of their neighborhoods and their families. They didn't know God. They were blind in their sin. So when he says humility, for our scholars and our historians and our history buffs, official and unofficial, you know that in the first century Greco-Roman world, humility was not something that the popular moral teachers of the day, the popular politicians and military leaders said was a good thing. They did not say, hey, strive to be humble, because they considered humility to be a form of weakness. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is fundamentally different than the ways of this world. C.S. Lewis said it this way, As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. There is a false humility as well. 
where we want people to notice our humility. It's sort of like the guy who said, well, I think I've mastered humility fairly well in my life. I just wrote a book on how I mastered humility, and I would like to sign it for you if you would like, right? Like kind of that false pseudo type of humility. No, this is considering others more highly than ourselves in a practical daily way. And you say, okay, now time out, Jeff. If I don't stand up for myself, if I develop humility, who will stand up for me? God himself will. And through the exercise of godly humility to where it doesn't have to be about me, it doesn't have to be about you, to where the questions in your home and my home change from what's in it for me to what's best for the family. When the questions in a local church change from what's best for me to what's best for the church, that's when you begin to see exponential growth and healing. So there's humility, there's gentleness. That doesn't mean weakness, but it means godly self-control. There's patience, and literally that means long-suffering. You know that? When you see the word patience in the Bible, often it's tied to the idea, as you're being patient, you are suffering a long time. Now, I know there's probably somebody out there in the room here who says, man, amen to that, Pastor Jeff. Like every time I'm patient, it's just like everything in me is wanting to scream because I don't like waiting. Welcome to the club. But as you wait, as you are patient in an appropriate way, God begins to change your character to conform you and I to the character of Christ. And then this phrase, bearing with one another in love, this has to do, this is just a gold mine in the original language here, this, this, these six verses, it's absolutely awesome. You could like literally teach uh, an entire message on each one of these words because they're, they're just so loaded down with truth. The phrase bearing with one another in love has to do with enduring one another. Come on. Putting up with one another. Bearing with. And that reminded me of a meme that I saw this past week, and it says this, sometimes I wonder how you put up with me, then I remember I put up with you, so we're even, right? And that's the natural way to say, you know, I think I've been putting up with you recently, but you've been putting up with me, but you know, I just begin to think how long I put up with you, and it's just that, that, uh, that, that striving for, well, I gave you this, so you have to give me that. And the gospel of Jesus Christ it highlights that that's where most of us naturally are are, but he gives us the strength, notice the key, the apostle Paul says to put up with, to bear with one another, here's the key, and this is the only way any of it will work, in love. In the original language, this is the word agape. This is you love, you put up with, you endure, you suffer through dealing with difficult people. Sometimes they are people who live in the same house that you do, in the same domicile. You see them on Thanksgiving and Christmas, but you love with the love with which you have been loved. In other words, the Apostle Paul is taking these believers, first-generation Christians, which I love that. And here at Grace, it seems like there's a rising number of you guys that you didn't grow up in a home. And mom and dad did the best that they could. They just, they just didn't know Jesus. They didn't know him. They didn't know the word of God. But through God's mercy and his grace, he transformed your heart. He opened the eyes of your soul. And now you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You know that it can only work with this key phrase from verse to in love. It is the love of Christ. When we think about long-suffering and bearing with the irritations of our families and our co-workers through this decade called 2020, and sometimes we say, well, I've about suffered long enough, Pastor Jeff. Then the Holy Spirit reminds us that when it says we are bearing the burden of dealing with this person, of dealing with this situation. We remember that Jesus Christ bore our sins on his shoulders at the cross. That whenever we think that the other person doesn't deserve us putting up with them any longer, it may be true. They don't deserve mercy, but the gospel reverses it again and says, Jeff, but you don't either. So you have an opportunity. You can call law. You can say, you know what? I'm going to cut you off. You're done. You don't deserve mercy, you don't deserve patience, or you can love with the love 
that God has loved you with. And sometimes we need proper boundaries, but even in that, there is love. Because brothers and sisters, some of us know this all too well, that it costs to carry. To put up with, to endure, to have that long suffering and to bear with one another, to to put up with, that costs something. And sometimes we can easily slip into the world's way of thinking that basically says this, once my putting up with you begins to cost me something, I'm out. But we see that Jesus Christ has promised to never leave us if we're a follower of Christ and never forsake us. And that is what the Apostle Paul is helping these first-generation Christians remember. They know it, but he's helping them remember that that is what God uses to help us walk in the tone of gentleness, humility, and long-suffering so we can bear with those that may not deserve it. And number three, in a time of chaos... The gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to walk towards the target of your calling, which is unity in the gospel of Christ. Notice again these words in these verses. Eager to maintain the unity of the, of the spirit in the bond of peace. In verses 4 through 6, a lot of Bible scholars believe that this is like an early hymn in the Christian church. Now, in verse 3, this has to do with being eager to maintain. This word eager has to do with loving what God loves. It's to maintain that, that very gently sustained reality of unity. Because we know this in church life, in business, in education, and in our homes, and in our relationships. That sometimes it takes a while to get to a point of unity, but unity can be fractured in just a moment. It can be one argument, one saying, one Facebook post, one Twitter retweet, and that unity can be damaged. So the Apostle Paul is telling these believers in a, in a, in a time of spiritual darkness, be eager not to advance your own agenda. Don't be eager to win people over to your side, but be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, but it's not done through coercion. It's not done by smashing people into line. It's done in the bond of peace. The word here, eager, means to be super quick, super careful. It means to hurry, to hasten. It means to speed up the process, to expedite the process. And we're all passionate about something, amen? We all have different things that we would like to see happen. But the Apostle Paul is reminding the believers of their one thing, to be eager to maintain. And the word here, maintain, again, the word here is just so so awesome. Again, they're just exploding with meaning. It's the word guard. It literally has to do with like a military detachment guarding a specific station, guarding a package, guarding a location with their own lives. Be eager, be quick to maintain that unity. Why does the Apostle Paul tell the believers to be quick, to be eager to get there to maintain and guard that peace? It's because if we're not quick to get there to maintain it, chaos will get there first. And we could even take it a step further. In a broken and fallen world, whether it's the first century in Asia Minor or here in the 21st century in the state of Florida, In the country of the United States of America, anywhere on the planet at any time, there is always chaos wanting to get into your family. There's always chaos wanting to get into the church. There's the chaos of the enemy that wants to break down the wall to get inside your mind and your hearts. That's why the word of God reminds us to be eager to maintain this Peace. It's to walk towards the target of unity because only when a family, when an individual in themselves as a follower of Christ, as a church, when they have unity, they can continue to go towards and on the mission. It's the question, what is good for the church? And guys, over these past few months, and obviously before that, God has just been so gracious to us as a church. If you've been a regular attender or a member here for any amount of time, or maybe you're just very new to us, know this, that God is in his grace and in his mercy, and he gets all of the praise and all of the glory, has allowed us to reach an incredible amount of people who have questions, who have questions about God, eternity, heaven, and hell. 
People who are scared and fearful about what's going on in the world. And not only that, so many of you guys have the testimony in your own life. You're having gospel conversations about Jesus with your friends and your family. And before 2020 rolled around, a lot of them just weren't interested yet. But God used your prayer and God is working in your life. I want to encourage you to continue to walk in your calling. Do not get distracted. Be eager to maintain that bond of the unity of peace in the spirit of Christ. And know this, that there's going to be a certain time to where we will bring home the harvest for the glory of God. Verses 4 and 5, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one, this is, this is good, this is good, to the one hope that belongs to your call. Man, this is, this is incredible. The Apostle Paul is literally saying a grandiose thing. He is making one of the greatest far-reaching claims that you could possibly imagine in that time and today when he says that the one hope, it belongs, it's trademarked, it's patent pending to your call. No other call, no other God, no other philosophy, no other political ism, nothing outside of faith in Christ alone can you actually say that you have any level of hope beyond the grave. And brothers and sisters, this is an entire series for another time, but only through the power of Christ, only through faith in Christ alone, only through living for him, whether it means persecution or whether it means that you prosper in some way and God's blessed you so that you can fund missions all around the world and get the gospel to people who don't yet have it, whether it's a good time in your life or a bad time, the call for you is constant, that your hope belongs to your call, and that is only made possible by the one who calls, and his name is Jesus Christ. So if God desires for believers and local churches to have a unified purpose, to have a unity together in heart and mind and soul and direction, then wouldn't it be rational to conclude that Satan may want to scheme to isolate and divide us? Brothers and sisters, each one of us has a role in maintaining the unity of the spirit of peace. Each one of us has a particular ability in our homes and in our churches and in our businesses and in our communities to speak the words of Christ, to be an ambassador from him. So let's ask the question once again, why eager to maintain that unity and peace within the church because it reflects who God is. God is the God of peace. God is the God of order. God is not the God of chaos. And unity around the gospel and peace within the church and in our homes, it keeps us together and on mission. As I was trying to dig into this text over these past couple of weeks and that word eager, quick, jumping towards it, just continue to just jump from the passage out to me. I thought... Back in 2009, when the incredible runner, a man among men from the great country of Jamaica, Hussein Bolt in Berlin, 2009, set that brand new world record, one of them that he set in the 100-meter dash. And I'd like you to watch 45 seconds of this new world record and see the power of his eagerness to get to the finish line. Let's check it out. Asafa Paul is the schnellste aus den Blöcken. Jetzt kommt G. Und jetzt ist Usain Bolt nicht zu halten. Nein, er gewinnt. 9,58 Weltrekord. Ein Wahnsinn. Well, I don't know about you. I think that just watching it in German makes it extra intense. That 100-meter dash, and he got across that finish line. The whole place went crazy. And I think one of my favorite parts was when he was just kind of strolling along after the wind. Did you guys notice that photographer who was literally running like a lion to keep up with Usain Bolt? What a run. What a record. What an eagerness to get 
to where he needed to be. And brothers and sisters, in this day and time, in this series and beyond, in 2020, 21, however long the Lord tarries, maybe some of you guys will be watching this years and decades from now, know this, that the call of Jesus Christ is for us to be quick, to be eager, to be expedited, to maintain the unity that God has given us so that we can withstand and navigate the chaos around us. Questions for us would be, what are you walking towards? For some of us, we may be running not towards the finish line that God has called us. We've become confused. We're off track. We're running in the opposite direction. But God is calling us to return to the track and the target of our call and do it with the tone that God has given us. And here's As far as Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations is concerned, brothers and sisters, we will remain on mission. God has placed us here to reach Palm Beach County, South Florida, and the world for Jesus Christ. And we will, as God gives us strength and patience and grace and knowledge, we will be faithful to that call no matter what it costs us because Jesus Christ has given us all that we need in him and he has given us his spirit who will never leave us and never forsake us. So next week, we're going to talk about understanding the chaos and how God's word leads us in these next set of verses to also withstand the chaos. May the Lord bless you and know that we love you. Oh, tears so sweet to trust in Jesus just to Just to rest upon his promise, just to know the Thank you so much for being with us today. As we continue in our new series, Calm in the Chaos, over the next four weeks, we'll be addressing how to navigate, withstand, rise above, and persevere through the chaos. If you're ready to follow Jesus, ready to be baptized by immersion, or simply need prayer, or if you have a question, let us know by filling out the online connect card and we will reach out to you. You can also help others by simply sharing this content. After the service, take some time to pray for those with you. And if you're alone, reach out to someone else and ask how you can pray for them. Finally, if you're a member or regular attender and you wish to give, you can do so by clicking the give link below. May the Lord bless you and know that if God is working in your heart, if you're having questions about him, he is at work. Let us know how we can help you in your faith journey and know that with Jesus Christ and only through Jesus Christ can we have hope in this life and beyond the grave. May the Lord bless you and we look forward to seeing you next week at Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations online.